Hi, and welcome to the Church Unlimited podcast. Church Unlimited is a vibrant, Bible-based church in North Lakes, Queensland that is passionate about helping people discover the genuine love of Jesus. If you're currently looking for a home church, we would love for you to join us for Sunday worship. For more information about our Sunday service or to find out how we can best help you, head to our website at churchunlimited.com.au. We hope you enjoy this message from Sunday service. Um, And I want to look at the Bible and what the Bible says about women because the Bible actually really does validate women, but you don't always see it at face value. Sometimes it looks like Scripture can demean women. Sometimes it looks like Scripture can be misogynistic. You know, it looks like women are property of men. And I think it's really important that we dig deep in our Bibles to understand the heart of God and why things are written the way that they are written. In order to do that, we need to understand a little bit about how the Bible was written. Um, A lot of people say that this is God's Word. I am one of them. I believe that this is God's Word. But the way that it was written is not what is called divine dictation. A lot of people believe, you know, God spoke to Jeremiah exactly what to say, and Jeremiah wrote it down exactly as God said it. A lot of people believe that. I actually don't believe that it was divine dictation. Because what happens is, We have a Bible that is written over 4,000 years through 40 different authors in three different languages, and you have such a diversity in the language for each book. And, And what you have to understand is that while the Bible is God's Word, it was written through the accent of humans. It was written with the accent of human beings. I'm a big believer. As much as I study the Word, when I first became a Christian, I loved the presence of God, but I really wasn't sure about the Bible. I I just thought, oh, I don't know about that. And, and, you know, is the Bible valid? Is it credible? And today is not the day that I'm going to go on that journey. We will do that later this year where we seek to validate Scripture. But I'm a believer that the Bible is without error. It is inerrant. I am also a believer that the Bible is infallible. Through all of my study and all the things that I've pulled apart and all the hard questions that I've had to ask, I firmly believe the Bible is without fail. It's infallible. But some things that are written in the Bible can be confusing. And I want to talk about accents for a moment because if you've been listening to me for any length of time, you know that I've got a pretty wacky accent. I uh, was born in California. I moved to North Carolina, which is technically a southern state. So, so, you know, it's like I went from one side of the U.S. to the other side of the U.S. If you know anything about the USA, don't think of one country. Think of 50 different countries because they're all unique in their own way. Different accents. Uh, I moved to Townsville, of all places. So I've spent 17 years in North Queensland where I met my Aka wife, who has a very Aka accent. And, and then I've, I moved to Brisbane. And, and my accent is, is all over the place. You know, in, in California, they say things like, you guys. Hey, you guys. In North Carolina, they say things like, y'all. Y'all. Let's, you know, we're going to go over to that Starbucks yonder. And, and come on, y'all, let's go. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, what does that even mean? And it's English. If you put some of the English countries or, or dialects in there, English people don't even speak English. Uh, it's, it's just like, I don't even know what they're saying, you know. And, uh, but you have so many different accents. The same is true within Australia. People um, from uh, Melbourne speak very different to people from Adelaide. If you're from South Australia, you've got an accent, right? You've got a very different accent. Uh, you can tell a lot uh, about somebody by their accent. You can tell when a person is, fu- is from, when. So if I said the word groovy, you know, people from the 70s would go, yep. If I said the word rad, oh, that's rad. You know, um, people would think, you know, he's from the 80s. You know, if I said the word sick, you know, that's fully sick. Everybody would think that they're totally sick with COVID. Unless you're a millennial, then you think it's good. 
I bet they've been so confused. The New King James Bible was the first English translation that we have. And it was translated from uh, Latin to English. And it was written in the 17th century with a 17th century English accent. This is why there's a lot of talk about lords and servants. Because the feudal system was actually really prevalent at the time. And it has an accent on it as it comes through. And so to understand Scripture, we need to understand the culture of the time when it was written to help us get the full picture of what God is really trying to say. I love how Shane Willard taught us a couple of weeks ago that we don't read Scripture as a static record. We see it as an evolving story that reveals more and more of who God is to His creation. It's progressively getting better as man and woman have a better revelation of who God is. They're able to articulate it in a better way. All the way until the fulfillment of Christ. And we see that God incarnate, Jesus, the flesh incarnate, is the ultimate manifestation of who God is. This isn't because God is changing. This is because our humanity, our understanding of who God is, is changing. God was the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so with that said, I think that there's some big misunderstandings and misconceptions about women in Scripture. And I want to take a minute and, 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 and diagnose those today and pull them apart, and we will try to go fast. You ready? Here's the first one. God is not male. God is not male. In 2007, there was a, an author named William Young, and he wrote a really interesting book called The Shack. This book got a lot of controversy because the main character has an encounter with God in a house. And that God in the Bible, or sorry, in that book, not in the Bible, that God in the book is an African-American woman. And that really messed with his head. He did not know how to digest the idea that God was an African-American woman. Because all of our pictures are that God is an old Jewish male. That's how we like to think. This was outrageous and drew a lot of controversy in Christian circles. Because, no, God can't be a mother. God is a father. It even uses personal pronouns, masculine pronouns, like he, him, and his. The Bible tells me that God is a father. And, and to be honest with you, when I was watching the movie and reading the book, I found the idea that God was an African-American woman just to be a little, like, a bit of a head-scratcher. But it's actually not as far-fetched as you might think. Why? Why? Well, the Bible says in Numbers 23, 19... That God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He is not a man. In John, 20, in John 4, 24, it says that God is spirit. And those who worship him must do so in spirit and in truth. God is not a man, nor is he a woman. He's spirit. And, and, and there are words that are used to describe God in Scripture that really do reinforce the idea that He is a father, that He is a shepherd, that He is a he. Let's, let's come back to the story of Genesis creation. In Genesis 1.26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Have you noticed the, the us and the our there? That's plural. I thought we're monotheistic, right? We serve a singular God, right? We serve one God, the Lord God. Who is the us and the our? Shouldn't it say, then God said, let me make man in my image? But it doesn't. It says, let us make man in our image. Well, without going too far down the rabbit hole, we see that this is the introduction of the Trinity. 
The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all represented in this one sentence. And then it says, let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing on earth that creeps. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created the him, male and female, he created them. Well, but wait a minute. Male and female are created in the image of God? I don't know about you, but for the longest time, I believed that man was created in the image of God and woman was created in the image of man. Because, you know, God creates the dust and breathes into it, puts his essence into it, but out of him takes the rib and makes the woman. But it actually specifically says that in his image, he created them male and female. Women and men both carry the likeness of God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You know what this tells me? If you put this passage with the creation passage, that God creates humanity, man and woman, in his likeness, male and female. When they come together, they make one flesh. Together, in the oneness, they are the truest reflection of the nature and the character of God. God put some of himself in Adam, and he put some of himself in Eve, that when the two come together, they become one flesh. That the man himself is not the representative of God, while the woman is some subservient subject. Together, they both are in the likeness of God. They are one flesh. This is why every child needs a mother and father. Because a male and a female represent different attributes and characteristics of who God is. Paula represents God to me in ways that I can't understand because I'm a bloke and I'm a bit thick. She gets it in different ways. Women actually show us half the nature of who God is because they were made in His likeness as much as I was. Women were not made in man's likeness. All right. It's very quiet in this room. Number two, God is not a misogynist. God is not a misogynist. If half If women reflect half of the nature of God, then God can't be a misogynist. Now, for those people who don't know what that word means, let me define it real quick. A misogynist is a person who dislikes, despises, or is strongly prejudiced towards women. Well, we kind of believe that until we open up the Bible and we start to read it with certain accents. There's accents on Scripture that... I believe that, but I'm not sure. Because like, you know, aren't women supposed to like submit and aren't women supposed to be subject to men and, and aren't, isn't, isn't man the head of the house and, and, and what's the go here? Again, you've got to open your Old Testament and you've got to understand how Scripture is written with the accent of Scripture. And whilst it can sound like God is a misogynist, it's impossible for that to be true because God created women to reflect half of His nature. It's totally contrary to the truth that women were created. To help understand this misogynist accent, we need to look back to the Garden of Eden in the fall. Remember in the Garden of Eden, we see that Satan comes and tempts Eve. And she partakes of the fruit, the forbidden fruit that she's not allowed to partake. And and she sins in her own right. And then she offers it to Adam who on his own volition sins and partakes of the fruit. They both did. Out of a willing, sinful heart, they both chose. She didn't tie him up, cut it all up into bite-sized pieces and force it down his mouth. He chose to eat the fruit on his own. Then God shows up and says, what were you thinking? And Eve said, oh, it's not my fault. The snake made me do it. 
And what's Adam say? It's not my fault. The woman made me do it. And immediately we have, instead of repentance, we have blame. Instead of, oh, Lord, we've missed it. We've missed it. We have got, no, they made me do it. I remember when I was a kid one time, I said something stupid, and my dad said, what were you thinking? And I said, Dad, it's not my fault. The devil made me do it. And he said, I'm going to proceed to spank the devil out of you. It didn't work. Then they get kicked out of the garden. Could you imagine living in perfect paradise? In perfect communion, perfect relationship with God. And then you transgress. And it's over. And you're kicked out of the garden. And the place that you've known and loved all your life is now guarded by big angels. And you're now living in the wilderness, stuck with the woman who offered you the fruit in the first place. I was doing good until she came along. Imagine the resentment and the bitterness that starts to take place in this man. Imagine the inferiority that takes place and the shame that takes place in the woman knowing full well that she was the one who offered it to him in the first place. This is the beginning of a misogynistic accent that you start to see in Scripture. It's not what you see in the garden at all. But it, through the fall and the introduction of sin, we now see the quarrel between man and woman that starts to really have its way. And of course, as men were the ones who wrote the Bible, they got to put their accent on it. That doesn't reflect the heart of God at all. Eve was not more sinful than Adam. He did it too. He was just as guilty as she was. And so it's important that we have to understand that whilst this is the word of God, it is written with the accent of fallen man. Slavery is a great example of that. Multiple wives is a great example of that. You know, Solomon is called the wisest man that's ever known. But how many wives did he have? He's not the wisest man. <laughs> I can only handle one. I couldn't imagine the complexities of more than one. I'm not that good. And so you see things creep up in Scripture that are the result of fallen humanity. But God chooses to use fallen humanity every Sunday at Church Unlimited when I preach the Word. And I stand here and I'm bringing God's word, but I'm bringing it with my quasi accent. I don't know, uh, you know, I, I, I aim to bring it my absolute best. But God chooses to use fallen vessels. Misogyny and the oppression of women is a result of the fall and the introduction of sin. The sin of man against woman. It's nothing to do with God. The issue is not God's heart towards women because that would, be counter, uh, that would be contradictory to himself. If Paula represents the heart of God or the, the, the likeness of God, how could Paula be possibly put down by God? This is why Jesus is so critical because Jesus comes to liberate women. Jesus says, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, nor male nor female. We are all equal and one with Christ. He's restoring us to our original image that is not the put down of a subservient woman, but the elevation. Now, Jesus was working within a Jewish culture. And the Jewish culture, much like the Middle Eastern culture, has a strong accent of misogyny. And so Jesus did everything that he possibly could do to liberate and validate women. The fall puts the spin on the relationship between man and woman, and we're still dealing with it today. This is why our women, this is why there's such a rise of feminism. I don't know about you, but I get really irritated with feminism. I do. I just think, man, some women are just 
It's too much. It's too domineering. It's too intense. It's too over the top. But feminism is a direct retaliation to the history of humanity, which has been so misogynistic and not outworking the heart of God. And so we see here that, that equal rights, you know, it's, you know in, I don't know what it was like in this country, but in our country, in the USA, men could vote, but women couldn't vote. It's like, are you joking? And then it was women, men could serve in the military, but, but women couldn't serve in the military. And now there's a big thing going around where, where women want fair pay, equal and comparable to what a man is getting. And misogyny is right through so many aspects of culture and society, and it's not God. Because we are both equal. Here's number three. Oh, women are equal to men. Yeah, get the punchline before I got there. In Genesis 1.27... It says, God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God created them both in his likeness. He created them male and female to be equal. Not just equal in his likeness, but equal in their function. Did you know that he gave them both the assignment of ruling the earth? He gave them both the assignment. He doesn't say, Adam, you are going to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. And, 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 you know, and, and, and Eve, you're going to make the sandwiches. How many, how many of us think like that? Husband is going to go off and, and, and in his business pursuits and, and he's going to go to uni and he's going to be the one who's the breadwinner and he's the earner and the wife is going to stay home and she's going to do the cooking and the cleaning and the, the child minding and she's going to do all those things. It doesn't say that at all. That is a concept that comes from the fall, not from God. Now, we've seen a retaliation from that, and I actually don't know a whole lot of women who, who are in my age or younger who live like that because women are getting jobs and women are pursuing things. But women are equal to men. It, it, I am not better than Paula. Okay, James, okay. Well, if, you know, I, 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 and I can see it on your face, the, the disagreement with me is prevalent on your face. Because, you know, James, well, well, why does it say in the Bible, you know, in Ephesians chapter 4, you know, because uh, we've been waiting for Ephesians 4 to come out, and so we better bring it out. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as you would to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. You got to read it with a pirate accent, don't you? In the most misogynistic, down putting, because that's the heart of God, you know. He's just putting women down. Therefore, as, just as the church is also subject to Christ, let wives be to their husbands in everything. <laughs> that's awesome. Whenever I want a sandwich, I'm hungry. It's Mother's Day, and I'm not making the sandwich on Mother's Day. Notice the word submission. Submit to your husbands. Submission can sound like it's subservient to the man. And this passage has been used for years to dominate wives. But if that's true, then it's contrary. To, to the fact that woman is made in the likeness of God and equal. And then all those other scriptures are null and void. We need to understand the word submit. The word submit literally means to willingly yield. I choose to submit. Notice the word is not obey. Wives, obey your husbands. 
Interesting. It's wives, submit to your husbands. It, it, it says, when, you, you can actually only submit when you're strong. If you're weak, if you're subservient, then, you're, then you must obey. Sir, yes, sir, you're the, you're the senior over me. But if you're strong, I can willingly choose to yield my position for you. That's what they said about Jesus. You think Jesus was weak going to the cross? He just chose to submit to the process. He said to Pilate, you don't have authority over me. But I will yield and surrender. Isn't that the likeness of God? Is that not what we see in the likeness of our spouse? But listen to the charge that Paul gives to men. Women get off easy. Submit to your husbands. Willingly yield. But listen, this is the rest of the passage that I have to live up to. That Paul got the easy part of that. Listen to what I have to do. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but he should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Paula is allowed to willingly yield to me. And I am to constantly die. <laughs> Paula gets the yielding part, and I get the cross. And I am supposed to love her the way that I love my own self. Well, I know a lot of men who use these verses in the areas of sex. And they use these verses in the area of asserting their dominance. That is not the heart of God. And, and there is stuff that happens in households under the banner of God that are not God. And we need to watch ourselves. Because the verse before wives submit to your husbands is submit one to another. And so we must see here that, that if Paula, the woman, is supposed to submit willingly yielding because she's strong. Oh, I'm supposed to die too. To my selfishness, to my desires, to my own misogyny. To the sandwich that I want? <laughs> we are supposed to be so selfless. Well, 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 doesn't Peter say that women are the weaker sex? Like, doesn't, doesn't he say that in 1 Peter, uh, uh, Peter 3, 7? It says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them in understanding, giving honor to the wife, as she's the weaker vessel. Hmm. And being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Oh my gosh, there's some stuff in there. Let's pack, unpack this. Husbands, dwell with them with understanding and honor. Because they're the weaker sex. They're the weaker vessel. Being heirs together. Uh-oh. What do you mean, heirs together? I thought I was over her. I thought she had to submit to my authority. <laughs> We're being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Peter is saying that, yes, he's saying that women are the weaker vessel. Doesn't sound good. I thought they were equal. Why does Peter call the woman the weaker vessel? It's not because he wants husbands to pity them. 
but he wants them to be understanding with them. Be understanding of the misogynistic culture that is constantly oppressing women. Women in that society were constantly disadvantaged. They were disadvantaged economically. They were disadvantaged legally. They were disadvantaged politically. They had less rights and less power in society than men. And so Peter is simply just addressing those circumstances. Are, they are weaker in society. I don't know if Paula can bench press as much as me, although she might be able to. She's pretty fit. But they were disadvantaged in society, and Peter is urging men, husbands, hey, be understanding of the position of your wife. What she's operating in is not the same for you. We live in a, they, they lived in a male privileged society. Women did not get those privileges. And so he's simply just saying, hey, you need to, you need to show understanding. She's, she's not actually weaker, she's equal. But in society... She's weaker. So show understanding and honor her. Well, what is honor? Honor is to lift her up. Honor is to elevate. Honor is to highly esteem. And so my role as the husband, anytime I see my wife being oppressed, anytime I see my wife being put down, I am to be understanding of the social culture and I am to be honoring, which is to lift her and elevate her back up. It's so important. Only if our men would live like that. And our women. Do you know that women would gladly submit? I reckon women would gladly submit if they had husbands that loved them like Christ loved the church. And then we wouldn't have all this friction anymore. Because we're supposed to be one. We're not supposed to be two that are butting heads. No, you submit. No, you No, we're equal. As we're both one in Christ. Here's number four. Fourth sacred cow I'm addressing. (laughs) Women were created to rule and to lead and to preach and speak. God created man and woman to be equal. Equal in his likeness and equal in purpose. (laughs) As we've read in in Genesis, oh, I, I, I'm, my little giggle, sorry. <laughs> Notice that God gives them both the purpose, the same purpose. They have the same purpose in the garden. Now we see that purpose drifts over time. So let's be careful that we don't build some false doctrine based on, on the fall. Let's go back pre-fall. And look at the purpose of a woman. A purpose of a woman that says, Then God blessed them. Verse 28. God blessed them and said to both of them, Be fruitful and multiply. Well, well, you know, it's like, you know, how does a woman, you know, how is she fruitful and multiply? By having babies. Well, men can't have babies. But God gives them both the same instruction. If it was be fruitful and multiply, then he would have said it to the woman if it was just about childbirth. But it was to both of them. They were both to be fruitful and multiply in everything. Because they both bore his likeness, they were both equal, and they have the same purpose to be fruitful and to multiply. Then it says, to them both, fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over every fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the living thing that moves on earth. Well, I thought that Adam was the one who named the animals. And that Eve was making the sandwiches for God and for Adam. Uh Uh-uh. They were both there. They were both equal in the presence of Almighty. Because they both reflect His likeness. They both manifest His his image and His purpose. God gave them both 
Well, James, I want to believe you, but, but what about 1 Corinthians 14? When Paul tells us to, to have our women be silent in churches, surely women can't speak and lead and have authority in church. 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Let your women be kept silent in churches, for they're not permitted to speak. <gasps> Dan, I'm in trouble. We had ladies all over this platform. <laughs> but they're to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. You, you hear the accent? It's an accent. There's definitely an accent. Remember the word submissive is not the same word as obedient. Very important to understand that they are not the same word. Submissive is a yielding in their heart. Obedience is a physical action. I've told my kids, Judah, take out the trash. Oh, he obeyed. <laughs> Joel, son, turn the Xbox off. <laughs> Did he obey? Did he have a submitted heart? <laughs> then then in in 1 Timothy 2 it continues. It says I desire that men Pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Notice that, I desire. I desire. Paul's saying, I desire. I'm going to pull that home, so you take note of that. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. In a like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and, moder and moderation. Not with braided hair. Who's got braided hair? You're out. <laughs> or gold or pearls or costly clothing. Any Louis Vuitton in the room? You're also out. But which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. There we go again. Hear that accent. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to preach or to have authority over a man. But to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived. See that? Now we've got the blaming going on. Adam, Adam was deceived by the woman. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing and sandwiches if they continue in faith, <laughs> love, and holiness with self-control. Oh my gosh, that's harsh. Paul, bro, what's with that? Okay, when you read something like that, it's critical that you listen for the accent. You got to listen for the accent. When you read that passage, after everything I've been telling you, why are you landing with that? That doesn't feel, land me up. Doesn't sound like the heart of God at all. Sounds terrible couple of things we need to know about this passage. Number one, notice how it starts. Notice how the passage starts. I desire therefore that men. I desire. Whose de who's desire? Paul's. Who's writing it? Paul's. Paul. Uh, there's multiple times in the scriptures where it says, I, Paul, am speaking, not God, but Paul am speaking. This is one of them. He says, I desire. How does Paul like church? Well, he just told you. You got you to listen for the accent. Paul's not sitting here 
prescribing the heart of God. Paul is just telling us what he prefers. Now, why is Paul so misogynistic? Well, you've got to understand who he's writing to. It's so important that we understand who he is talking to. Shane Willard gave us a great message back a couple of weeks ago about what was happening in Ephesus and Corinth. Timothy, this written, this is a letter written to Timothy. Timothy was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. This, I pulled out two passages from Corinth, Corinthians, letter to the Corinth people, Corinthian people at Corinth. The Ephesians, Timothy was the pastor to them. And he's written specific letters to specific churches. Why? Well, Shane Willard was talking to us about the goddess Diana. Do you remember? Do we have that photo, Trent? Did I send the photo? I sent the photo. Do you remember when, when Shane showed us the photo that looked like this? The, this region of people were pagans that worshipped the goddess Artemides or Diana. And she was the mother of all gods. The mother of all gods. This is why she has so many boobs. Because she nourishes all the other gods. Such was the culture of this specific region that the women were the dominant force in this specific region. Shane was telling us about this just a couple of weeks ago. Women were the oppressors in this region. Women, during the preaching, would be outspoken and say, oh, I don't agree with that. And they would stand up and they would cause a ruckus in, in a meeting, and it was just totally out of order. And Paul, in speaking to that specific church, is saying, hey, this is how I like church. Don't do that anymore. Women were the dominant in that society. Women went to work while men made the sandwiches. And so you have to understand that when Paul writes this, he's writing a very specific letter with a very specific accent to a very specific church at a very specific time to address a very specific issue. Further, Paul had no idea that in the year 2021, 2022, we would still be reading that letter. Paul was absolutely convinced that the Lord was going to return in his time. He did not write a Bible book. He wrote a letter to a very specific people at a very specific time. And then that letter got put in a culmination of letters called the canon. And it's now what we know as the New Testament. This is not one book. This is 66 different books. And so if you read them all as just one, you know, biography, or if you read them all as one history book, you're in trouble. Further, why does the New Testament validate so many women in leadership? The New Testament shows us that there were so many significant women in prominent roles in leadership. Why was Mary the mother of Jesus, so highly regarded. Do you know that Mary, it, it, we don't read of any mention of Joseph in the latter years of Jesus. There's a fair chance that, that Joseph, we don't know what happened to him, but there's a fair chance that Jesus was raised in a single parent family. Can I just say this to all the single moms out there? Keep going. What you're doing is valid. It's so important. You might feel like you're doing it all on your own. You are. But Mary did it and she raised God. In Acts 19, it tells us that both Priscilla and Aquila taught and trained Paul and Apollos. If Paul meant that no women were allowed to speak, then why does he specifically mention Priscilla and Aquila trained him in Bible college? And why does he put Priscilla first? That's quite countercultural. We don't even mention the woman, really. 
And if we do, we definitely wouldn't put her first. Paul was speaking in Timothy and Corinthians to a very specific people group. He was not speaking to Church Unlimited in 2022. However, there's some beautiful truth in there that we need to pull out of it and digest and appreciate. Mary Magdalene, Mary and Martha, Tabitha and Dorcas. Uh, Tabitha, her name is also Dorcas. She, she wasn't very popular. Um, <laughs> do you know that, that Dorcas was so, so significant that when she died, they raised her back to life so that she can continue ministering? Yeah. Oh, it's another woman. There's heaps of sandwich makers around here. Let's get another one. No. No, that woman, Dorcas, tragic name, was so significant. Mate, she's dead. Flip, there's not another one of these around. Let's raise her back to life. She was so important. Thanks for joining us. We pray that you and your family are richly blessed by the love and grace of Jesus. If you're ever in the area, we would love for you to join us for Sunday worship. 